Chapter 3 of My Life and Work. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Marcetich, Alexandria, Virginia, June 2010. My Life and Work by Henry Ford, in collaboration with Samuel Crowther. Chapter 3. Starting the Real Business In the little brick shop at 81 Park Place, I had ample opportunity to work out the design and some of the methods of manufacture of a new car, even if it were possible to organize the exact kind of corporation that I wanted, one in which doing the work well and suiting the public would be controlling factors, it became apparent that I never could produce a thoroughly good motor car that might be sold at a low price under the existing cut-and-try manufacturing methods. Everybody knows that it is always possible to do a thing better the second time. I do not know why manufacturing should not at that time have generally recognized this as a basic fact, unless it might be that the manufacturers were in such a hurry to obtain something to sell that they did not take time for adequate preparation. Making to order instead of making in volume is, I suppose, a habit, a tradition, that has descended from the old handicraft days. Ask a hundred people how they want a particular article made. About eighty will not know. They will leave it to you. Fifteen will think that they must say something, while five really have preferences and reasons. The ninety-five, made up of those who do not know and admit it, and the fifteen who do not know but do not admit it, constitute the real market for any product. The five who want something special may or may not be able to pay the price for special work. If they have the price, they can get the work but they constitute a special and limited market. Of the ninety-five, perhaps ten or fifteen will pay a price for quality. Of those remaining, a number will buy solely on the price and without regard to quality. Their numbers are thinning with each day. Buyers are learning how to buy. The majority will consider quality and buy the biggest dollar's worth of quality. If... Therefore, you discover what will give this 95% of people the best all-round service, and then arrange to manufacture at the very highest quality and sell at the very lowest price, you will be meeting a demand which is so large that it may be called universal. This is not standardizing. The use of the word standardizing is very apt to lead one into trouble for it implies a certain freezing of design and method, and usually works out so that the manufacturer selects whatever article he can the most easily make and sell at the highest profit. The public is not considered either in the design or in the price. The thought behind most standardization is to be able to make a larger profit. The result is that, with the economies which are inevitable if you make only one thing, a larger and larger profit is continually being had by the manufacturer. His output also becomes larger, his facilities produce more, and before he knows it, his markets are overflowing with goods which will not sell. These goods would sell if the manufacturer would take a lower price for them. There is always buying power present, but that buying power will not always respond to reductions in price. If an article has been sold at too high a price, and then, because of stagnant business, the price is suddenly cut, the response is sometimes most disappointing. And for a very good reason, the public is wary. It thinks that the price cut is a fake, and it sits around waiting for a real cut. We saw much of that last year. If, on the contrary, the economies of making are transferred at once to the price, and if it is well known 
that such is the policy of the manufacturer, the public will have confidence in him and will respond. They will trust him to give honest value. So standardization may seem bad business unless it carries with it the plan of constantly reducing the price at which the article is sold. And the price has to be reduced. This is very important because of the manufacturing economies that have come about and not because the falling demand by the public indicates that it is not satisfied with the price. The public should always be wondering how it is possible to give so much for the money. Standardization, to use the word as I understand it, is not just taking one's best-selling article and concentrating on it. It is planning day and night, and probably for years, first on something which will best suit the public, and then on how it should be made. The exact processes of manufacturing will develop of themselves, then, if we shift the manufacturing from the profit to the service basis, we shall have a real business in which the profits will be all that any one could desire. All of this seems self-evident to me. It is the logical basis of any business that wants to serve 95% of the community. It is the logical way in which the community can serve itself. I cannot comprehend why all business does not go on this basis. All that has to be done in order to adopt it is to overcome the habit of grabbing at the nearest dollar as though it were the only dollar in the world. The habit has already to an extent been overcome. All the large and successful retail stores in this country are on the one price basis, the only further step required is to throw overboard the idea of pricing on what the traffic will bear and instead go to the common sense basis of pricing on what it costs to manufacture and then reducing the cost of manufacture. If the design of the product has been sufficiently studied, then changes in it will come very slowly. But changes in manufacturing processes will come very rapidly and wholly naturally. That has been our experience in everything we have undertaken. How naturally it has all come about, I shall later outline. The point that I wish to impress here is that it is impossible to get a product on which one may concentrate unless an unlimited amount of study is given beforehand. It is not just an afternoon's work. These ideas were forming with me during this year of experimenting. Most of the experimenting went into the building of racing cars. The idea in those days was that a first-class car ought to be a racer. I never really thought much of racing, but following the bicycle idea, the manufacturers had the notion that winning a race on a track told the public something about the merits of an automobile although I can hardly imagine any test that would tell less. But, as the others were doing it, I, too, had to do it. In 1903, with Tom Cooper, I built two cars solely for speed. They were quite alike. One we named the 999 and the other the Arrow. If an automobile were going to be known for speed, then I was going to make an automobile that would be known wherever speed was known. These were. I put in four great big cylinders, giving 80 horsepower, which up to that time had been unheard of. The roar of those cylinders alone was enough to half kill a man. There was only one seat. One life to a car was enough. I tried out the cars. Cooper tried out the cars. We let them out at full speed. I cannot quite describe the sensation. Going over Niagara Falls would have been but a pastime after a ride in one of them. I did not want to take the responsibility of racing the 999, which we put up first. Neither did Cooper. Cooper said he knew a man who lived on speed, that nothing could go too fast for him. He wired to Salt Lake City, 
and on came a professional bicycle rider named Barney Oldfield. He had never driven a motor car, but he liked the idea of trying it. He said he would try anything once. It took us only a week to teach him how to drive. The man did not know what fear was. All that he had to learn was how to control the monster. Controlling the fastest car of today was nothing as compared to controlling that car. The steering wheel had not yet been thought of. All the previous cars that I had built simply had tillers. On this one, I put a two-handed tiller, for holding the car in line required all the strength of a strong man. The race for which we were working was at three miles on the Gross Point track. We kept our cars as a dark horse. We left the predictions to the others. The tracks then were not scientifically banked. It was not known how much speed a motor car could develop. No one knew better than Oldfield what the turns meant, and as he took his seat, while I was cranking the car for the start, he remarked cheerily, well, this chariot may kill me, but they will say afterward that I was going like hell when she took me over the bank. And he did go. He never dared to look around. He did not shut off on the curves. He simply let that car go, and go it did. He was about half a mile ahead of the next man at the end of the race. The 999 did what it was intended to do. It advertised the fact that I could build a fast motor car. A week after the race, I formed the Ford Motor Company. I was vice president, designer, master mechanic, superintendent, and general manager. The capitalization of the company was $100,000, and of this I owned 25 and one half percent. The total amount subscribed in cash was about $28,000, which is the only money that the company has ever received for the capital fund from other than operations. In the beginning, I thought that it was possible, notwithstanding my former experience, to go forward with a company in which I owned less than the controlling share. I very shortly found I had to have control and therefore in 1906, with funds that I had earned in the company, I bought enough stock to bring my holdings up to 51%, and a little later bought enough more to give me 58 and one half percent The new equipment and the whole progress of the company have always been financed out of earnings. In 1919, my son Edsel purchased the remaining 41 and one half percent of the stock because certain of the minority stockholders disagreed with my policies. For these shares, he paid at the rate of 12,500 for each 100 par and in all paid about 75 millions. The original company and its equipment, as may be gathered, were not elaborate. We rented Stralo's carpenter shop on Mac Avenue. In making my designs, I had also worked out the methods of making, but since at that time we could not afford to buy machinery, the entire car was made according to my designs, but by various manufacturers, and about all we did, even in the way of assembling, was to put on the wheels, the tires, and the body. That would really be the most economical method of manufacturing, if only one could be certain that all of the various parts would be made on the manufacturing plan that I have above outlined. The most economical manufacturing of the future will be that in which the whole of an article is not made under one roof, unless, of course, it be a very simple article. The modern, or better, the future method is to have each part made where it may best be made and then assemble the parts into a complete unit at the points of consumption. That is the method we are now following and expect to extend. It would make no difference whether one company or one individual 
owned all the factories fabricating the component parts of a single product, or whether such part were made in our independently owned factory, if only all adopted the same service methods. If we can buy as good a part as we can make ourselves, and the supply is ample and the price right, we do not attempt to make it ourselves, or, at any rate, to make more than an emergency supply. In fact, it might be better to have the ownership widely scattered. I had been experimenting principally on the cutting down of weight. Excess weight kills any self-propelled vehicle. There are a lot of fool ideas about weight. It is queer, when you come to think of it, how some fool terms get into current use. There is the phrase heavyweight, as applied to a man's mental apparatus. What does it mean? No one wants to be fat and heavy of body. Then why of head? For some clumsy reason, we have come to confuse strength with weight. The crude methods of early building undoubtedly had much to do with it. The old ox cart weighed a ton, and it had so much weight that it was weak. To carry a few tons of humanity from New York to Chicago, the railroad builds a train that weighs many hundred tons, and the result is an absolute loss of real strength and the extravagant waste of untold millions in the form of power. The law of diminishing returns begins to operate at the point where strength becomes weight. Weight may be desirable in a steamroller, but nowhere else. Strength has nothing to do with weight. The mentality of the man who does things in the world is agile, light, and strong. The most beautiful things in this world are those from which all excess weight has been eliminated. Strength is never just weight, either in men or things. Whenever anyone suggests to me that I might increase weight or add a part, I look into decreasing weight and eliminating a part. The car that I designed was lighter than any car that had yet been made. It would have been lighter if I had known how to make it so. Later, I got the materials to make the lighter car. In our first year, we built Model A, selling the runabout for $850 and the tonneau for $100 more. This model had a two-cylinder opposed motor developing eight horsepower. It had a chain drive, a 72-inch wheelbase, which was supposed to be long, and a fuel capacity of five gallons. We made and sold 1,708 cars in the first year. That is how well the public responded. Every one of those Model A's has a history. Take number 420. Colonel D.C. Collier of California bought it in 1904. He used it for a couple of years, sold it, and bought a new Ford. Number 420 changed hands frequently until 1907, when it was bought by one Edmund Jacobs, living near Ramona in the heart of the mountains. He drove it for several years in the roughest kind of work. Then he bought a new Ford and sold his old one. By 1915, number 420 had passed into the hands of a man named Cantello, who took out the motor, hitched it to a water pump, rigged up shafts on the chassis, and now, while the motor chugs away at the pumping of water, the chassis drawn by a burrow acts as a buggy. The moral, of course, is that you can dissect a Ford, but you cannot kill it. In our first advertisement, we said, Our purpose is to construct and market an automobile specially designed for everyday wear and tear, business, professional, and family use, an automobile which will attain to a sufficient speed to satisfy the average person without acquiring any of those breakneck velocities which are so universally condemned, a machine which will be admired by man, woman, and child alike for its compactness, its simplicity, its safety, 
its all-around convenience, and, last but not least, its exceedingly reasonable price, which places it within the reach of many thousands who could not think of paying the comparatively fabulous prices asked for most machines. And these are the points we emphasized. Good material. Simplicity. Most of the cars at that time required considerable skill in their management. The engine. The ignition which was furnished by two sets of six dry cell batteries. The automatic oiling. The simplicity and the ease of control of the transmission, which was of the planetary type. The workmanship. We did not make the pleasure appeal. We never have. In its first advertising, we showed that a motor car was a utility. We said... We often hear quoted the old proverb, time is money, and yet how few business and professional men act as if they really believed its truth. Men who are constantly complaining of shortage of time and lamenting the fewness of days in the week, men to whom every five minutes wasted means a dollar thrown away, men to whom five minutes delay sometimes means the loss of many dollars, will yet depend on the haphazard, uncomfortable, and limited means of transportation afforded by streetcars, etc., when the investment of an exceedingly moderate sum in the purchase of a perfected, efficient, high-grade automobile would cut out anxiety and unpunctuality and provide a luxurious means of travel ever at your beck and call. Always ready, always sure. Built to save you time and consequent money. Built to take you anywhere you want to go and bring you back again on time. Built to add to your reputation for punctuality. To keep your customers good-humored and in a buying mood. Built for business or pleasure, just as you say built also for the good of your health, to carry you jarlessly over any kind of half-decent roads, to refresh your brain with the luxury of much outdoorness, and your lungs with the tonic of tonics, the right kind of atmosphere. It is your say, too, when it comes to speed. You can, if you choose, loiter lingeringly through shady avenues, or you can press down on the foot lever until all the scenery looks alike to you, and you have to keep your eyes skinned to count the milestones as they pass. I am giving the gist of this advertisement to show that, from the beginning, we were looking to provide service. We never bothered with a sporting car. The business went along almost as by magic. The cars gained a reputation for standing up, they were tough, they were simple, and they were well made. I was working on my design for a universal single model, but I had not settled on the designs, nor had we the money to build and equip the proper kind of plant for manufacturing. I had not the money to discover the very best and lightest materials. We still had to accept the materials that the market offered. We got the best to be had, but we had no facilities for the scientific investigation of materials or for original research. My associates were not convinced that it was possible to restrict our cars to a single model. The automobile trade was following the old bicycle trade, in which every manufacturer thought it necessary to bring out a new model each year and to make it so unlike all previous models that those who had bought the former models would want to get rid of the old and buy the new. That was supposed to be good business. It is the same idea that women submit to in their clothing and hats. That is not service. It seeks only to provide something new, not something better. It is extraordinary how firmly rooted is the notion that business, continuous selling, 
depends not on satisfying the customer once and for all, but on first getting his money for one article, and then persuading him he ought to buy a new and different one. The plan which I then had in the back of my head, but to which we were not then sufficiently advanced to give expression, was that, when a model was settled upon, then every improvement on that model should be interchangeable with the old model, so that a car should never get out of date. It is my ambition to have every piece of machinery, or other non-consumable product that I turn out, so strong and so well made, that no one ought ever to have to buy a second one. A good machine of any kind ought to last as long as a good watch. In the second year, we scattered our energies among three models. We made a four-cylinder touring car, Model B, which sold for $2,000. Model C, which was a slightly improved Model A, and sold at $50 more than the former price. And Model F, a touring car which sold for $1,000. That is, we scattered our energy and increased prices, and therefore we sold fewer cars than in the first year. The sales were 1,695 cars. That Model B, the first four-cylinder car for general road use, had to be advertised. Winning a race or making a record was then the best kind of advertising. So I fixed up the arrow, the twin of the old 999, in fact, practically remade it, and a week before the New York Automobile Show, I drove it myself over a surveyed mile straightaway on the ice. I shall never forget that race. The ice seemed smooth enough, so smooth, that if I had called off the trial, we should have secured an immense amount of the wrong kind of advertising. But instead of being smooth, the ice was seamed with fissures, which I knew were going to mean trouble the moment I got up to speed. But there was nothing to do but go down through with the trial, and I let the old arrow out. At every fissure, the car leaped into the air. I never knew how it was coming down. When I wasn't in the air, I was skidding, but somehow I stayed top side up and on the course making a record that went all over the world. That put Model B on the map, but not enough on to overcome the price advances. No stunt and no advertising will sell an article for any length of time. Business is not a game. The moral is coming. Our little wooden shop had, with the business we were doing, become totally inadequate and in 1906 we took out our working capital sufficient funds to build a three-story plant at the corner of Piquette and Bubin streets, which for the first time gave us real manufacturing facilities. We began to make and to assemble quite a number of the parts, although still we were principally an assembling shop. In 1905 to 1906, we made only two models, one of the four-cylinder car at $2,000 and another touring car at $1,000, both being the models of the previous year, and our sales dropped to 1,599 cars. Some said it was because we had not brought out new models. I thought it was because our cars were too expensive. They did not appeal to the 95%. I changed the policy in the next year, having first acquired stock control. For 1906 to 1907, we entirely left off making touring cars and made three models of runabouts and roadsters, none of which differed materially from the other in manufacturing process or in component parts but were somewhat different in appearance. The big thing was that the cheapest car sold for $600 and the most expensive for only 750 
and right there came the complete demonstration of what price meant. We sold 8,423 cars, nearly five times as many as in our biggest previous year. Our banner week was that of May 15, 1908, when we assembled 311 cars in six working days. It almost swamped our facilities. The foreman had a tally board on which he chalked up each car as it was finished and turned over to the testers. The tally board was hardly equal to the task. On one day in the following June, we assembled an even 100 cars. In the next year, we departed from the program that had been so successful, and I designed a big car, 50 horsepower, 6 cylinder, that would burn up the roads. We continued making our small cars, but the 1907 panic and the diversion to the more expensive model cut down the sales to 6,398 cars. We had been through an experimenting period of five years. The cars were beginning to be sold in Europe. The business, as an automobile business then went, was considered extraordinarily prosperous. We had plenty of money. Since the first year, we have practically always had plenty of money. We sold for cash, we did not borrow money, and we sold directly to the purchaser. We had no bad debts, and we kept within ourselves on every move. I have always kept well within my resources. I have never found it necessary to strain them, because, inevitably, if you give attention to work and service, the resources will increase more rapidly than you can devise ways and means of disposing of them. We were careful in the selection of our salesmen. At first, there was a great difficulty in getting good salesmen because the automobile trade was not supposed to be stable. It was supposed to be dealing in a luxury, in pleasure vehicles. We eventually appointed agents, selecting the very best men we could find, and then paying them a salary larger than they could possibly earn in business for themselves. In the beginning, we had not paid much in the way of salaries. We were feeling our way, but when we knew what our way was, we adopted the policy of paying the very highest reward for service and then insisting upon getting the highest service. Among the requirements for an agent, we laid down the following. 1. A progressive, up-to-date man keenly alive to the possibilities of business. 2. A suitable place of business, clean and dignified in appearance. 3. A stock of parts, sufficient to make prompt replacements and keep in active service every Ford car in his territory. 4. An adequately equipped repair shop, which has in it the right machinery for every necessary repair and adjustment. 5. Mechanics who are thoroughly familiar with the construction and operation of Ford cars. 6. A comprehensive bookkeeping system and a follow-up sales system, so that it may be instantly apparent what is the financial status of the various departments of his business, the condition and size of his stock, the present owners of cars, and the future prospects. 7. Absolute cleanliness through every department. There must be no unwashed windows, dusty furniture, dirty floors. 8. A suitable display sign. 9. The adoption of policies which will ensure absolutely square dealing and the highest character of business ethics. And this is the general instruction that was issued. A dealer or salesman ought to have the name of every possible automobile buyer in his territory, including all those who have never given the matter a thought. He should then personally solicit by visitation, if possible, by correspondence at the least, every man on that list, and then making necessary memoranda, 
know the automobile situation as related to every resident so solicited. If your territory is too large to permit this, you have too much territory. The way was not easy. We were harried by a big suit brought against the company to try to force us into line with an association of automobile manufacturers who were operating under the false principle that there was only a limited market for automobiles and that a monopoly of that market was essential. This was the famous Selden patent suit. At times, the support of our defense severely strained our resources. Mr. Selden, who has but recently died, had little to do with the suit. It was the association which sought a monopoly under the patent. The situation was this. George B. Selden, a patent attorney, filed an application as far back as 1879 for a patent the object of which was stated to be the production of a safe, simple, and cheap road locomotive, light in weight, easy to control, possessed of sufficient power to overcome an ordinary inclination. The application was kept alive in the patent office by methods which are perfectly legal until 1895 when the patent was granted. In 1879, when the application was filed, the automobile was practically unknown to the general public, but by the time the patent was issued, everybody was familiar with self-propelled vehicles, and most of the men, including myself, who had been for years working on motor propulsion, were surprised to learn that what we had made practicable was covered by an application of years before, although the applicant had kept his idea merely as an idea. He had done nothing to put it into practice. The specific claims under the patent were divided into six groups, and I think that not a single one of them was really a new idea even in 1879 when the application was filed. The patent office allowed a combination and issued a so-called combination patent, deciding that the combination A of a carriage with its body machinery and steering wheel with the B propelling mechanism clutch and gear, and finally C, the engine, made a valid patent. With all of that, we were not concerned. I believed that my engine had nothing whatsoever in common with what Selden had in mind. The powerful combination of manufacturers, who called themselves the licensed manufacturers because they operated under licenses from the patentee, brought suit against us as soon as we began to be a factor in motor production. The suit dragged on. It was intended to scare us out of business. We took volumes of testimony, and the blow came on September 15, 1909, when Judge Hugh rendered an opinion in the United States District Court finding against us. Immediately that licensed association began to advertise, warning prospective purchasers against our cars. They had done the same thing in 1903 at the start of the suit, when it was thought that we could be put out of business. I had implicit confidence that eventually we should win our suit. I simply knew that we were right, but it was a considerable blow to get the first decision against us, for we believed that many buyers, even though no injunction was issued against us, would be frightened away from buying because of the threats of court action against individual owners. The idea was spread that if the suit finally went against me, every man who owned a Ford car would be prosecuted. Some of my more enthusiastic opponents, I understand, gave it out privately that there would be criminal as well as civil suits, and that a man buying a Ford car might as well be buying a ticket to jail. 
we answered with an advertisement for which we took four pages in the principal newspapers all over the country. We set out our case. We set out our confidence in victory, and in conclusion, said, In conclusion, we beg to state that if there are any prospective automobile buyers who are at all intimidated by the claims made by our adversaries, that we will give them, in addition to the protection of the Ford Motor Company, with its some six million dollars of assets, an individual bond backed by a company of more than six million more of assets, so that each and every individual owner of a Ford car will be protected until at least twelve million dollars of assets have been wiped out by those who desire to control and monopolize this wonderful industry. The bond is yours for the asking, so do not allow yourself to be sold inferior cars at extravagant prices because of any statement made by this divine body. N.B. This fight is not being waged by the Ford Motor Company without the advice and counsel of the ablest patent attorneys of the East and West. We thought that the bond would give assurance to the buyers, that they needed confidence. They did not. We sold more than 18,000 cars, nearly double the output of the previous year, and I think about 50 buyers asked for bonds. Perhaps it was less than that. As a matter of fact, Probably nothing so well advertised the Ford car and the Ford Motor Company than did this suit. It appeared that we were the underdog and we had the public sympathy. The association had $70 million. We, at the beginning, had not half that number of thousands. I never had a doubt as to the outcome, but nevertheless, it was a sword hanging over our heads that we could as well do without. Prosecuting that suit was probably one of the most short-sighted acts that any group of American businessmen has ever combined to commit. Taken in all its sidelights, it forms the best possible example of joining unwittingly to kill a trade. I regard it as most fortunate for the automobile makers of the country that we eventually won, and the association ceased to be a serious factor in the business. By 1908, however, in spite of this suit, we had come to a point where it was possible to announce and put into fabrication the kind of car that I wanted to build. End of chapter 3「My Life and Work」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Marcetich, Alexandria, Virginia, June 2010. « My Life and Work » by Henry Ford in collaboration with Samuel Crowther. Chapter 4 the secret of manufacturing and serving. Now, I am not outlining the career of the Ford Motor Company for any personal reason. I am not saying, go thou and do likewise. What I am trying to emphasize is that the ordinary way of doing business is not the best way. I am coming to the point of my entire departure from the ordinary methods. From this point dates the extraordinary success of the company. We had been fairly following the custom of the trade. Our automobile was less complex than any other. We had no outside money in the concern, but aside from these two points, we did not differ materially from the other automobile companies, excepting that we had been somewhat more successful and had rigidly pursued the policy of taking all cash discounts, putting our profits back into the business, and maintaining a large cash balance, 
we entered cars in all of the races. We advertised and we pushed our sales. Outside of the simplicity of the construction of the car, our main difference in design was that we made no provision for the purely pleasure car. We were just as much a pleasure car as any other car on the market, but we gave no attention to purely luxury features. We would do special work for a buyer, and I suppose that we would have made a special car at a price. We were a prosperous company. We might easily have sat down and said, Now we have arrived. Let us hold what we have got. Indeed, there was some disposition to take this stand. Some of the stockholders were seriously alarmed when our production reached 100 cars a day. They wanted to do something to stop me from ruining the company, and when I replied to the effect that 100 cars a day was only a trifle, and that I hoped before long to make a 1,000 a day, they were inexpressibly shocked and I understand seriously contemplated court action. If I had followed the general opinion of my associates, I should have kept the business about as it was, put our funds into a fine administration building, tried to make bargains with such competitors as seemed too active, made new designs from time to time to catch the fancy of the public, and generally have passed on into the position of a quiet, respectable citizen with a quiet, respectable business. The temptation to stop and hang on to what one has is quite natural. I can entirely sympathize with the desire to quit a life of activity and retire to a life of ease. I have never felt the urge myself, but I can comprehend what it is, although I think that a man who retires ought entirely to get out of a business. There is a disposition to retire and retain control. It was, however, no point of my plan to do anything of that sort. I regarded our progress merely as an invitation to do more, as an indication that we had reached a place where we might begin to perform a real service. I had been planning every day through those years toward a universal car. The public had given its reactions to the various models. The cars in service, the racing, and the road tests gave excellent guides as to the changes that ought to be made, and even by 1905 I had fairly in mind the specifications of the kind of car I wanted to build but I lacked the material to give strength without weight. I came across that material almost by accident. In 1905, I was at a motor race at Palm Beach. There was a big smash-up, and a French car was wrecked. We had entered our Model K, the high-powered 6. I thought the foreign cars had smaller and better parts than we knew anything about. After the wreck, I picked up a little valve strip stem. It was very light and very strong. I asked what it was made of. Nobody knew. I gave the stem to my assistant. Find out all about this, I told him. That is the kind of material we ought to have in our cars. He found eventually that it was a French steel and there was vanadium in it. We tried every steel maker in America not one could make vanadium steel. I sent to England for a man who understood how to make the steel commercially. The next thing was to get a plant to turn it out. That was another problem. Vanadium requires 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The ordinary furnace could not go beyond 2,700 degrees. I found a small steel company in Canton, Ohio. I offered to guarantee them against loss if they would run a heat for us. They agreed. The first heat was a failure. Very little vanadium remained in the steel. I had them try again, and the second time the steel came through. Until then, we had been forced to be satisfied with steel running between 60,000 and 70,000 pounds tensile strength. With vanadium, 
the strength went up to 170,000 pounds. Having vanadium in hand, I pulled apart our models and tested in detail to determine what kind of steel was best for every part, whether we wanted a hard steel, a tough steel, or an elastic steel. We, for the first time, I think, in the history of any large construction, determined scientifically the exact quality of the steel. As a result, we then selected 20 different types of steel for the various steel parts. About 10 of these were vanadium. Vanadium was used wherever strength and lightness were required. Of course, they are not all the same kind of vanadium steel. The other elements vary according to whether the part is to stand hard wear or whether it needs spring. In short, according to what it needs. Before these experiments, I believe that not more than four different grades of steel had ever been used in automobile construction. By further experimenting, especially in the direction of heat treating, we have been able still further to increase the strength of the steel and therefore to reduce the weight of the car. In 1910, the French Department of Commerce and Industry took one of our steering spindle connecting rod yokes, selecting it as a vital unit, and tried it against a smaller part from what they considered the best French car, and in every test, our steel proved the stronger. The vanadium steel disposed of much of the weight. The other requisites of a universal car I had already worked out, and many of them were in practice. The design had to balance. Men die because a part gives out. Machines wreck themselves because some parts are weaker than others. Therefore, a part of the problem in designing a universal car was to have as nearly as possible all parts of equal strength considering their purpose, to put a motor in a one-horse shay. Also, it had to be foolproof. This was difficult because a gasoline motor is essentially a delicate instrument, and there is a wonderful opportunity for anyone who has a mind that way to mess it up. I adopted this slogan. When one of my cars breaks down, I know I am to blame. From the day the first motor car appeared on the streets, it had to me appeared to be a necessity. It was this knowledge and assurance that led me to build to the one end, a car that would meet the wants of the multitudes. All my efforts were then, and still are, turned to the production of one car, one model, and, year following year, the pressure was, and still is, to improve and refine and make better with an increasing reduction in price. The universal car had to have these attributes. 1. Quality in material to give service in use. Vanadium steel is the strongest, toughest, and most lasting of steels. It forms the foundation and superstructure of the cars. It is the highest quality steel in this respect in the world, regardless of price. 2. Simplicity in operation, because the masses are not mechanics. 3. Power in sufficient quantity. 4. Absolute reliability, because of the varied uses to which the cars would be put and the variety of roads over which they would travel. 5. Lightness, with the Ford, there are only 7.95 pounds to be carried by each cubic inch of piston displacement. This is one of the reasons why Ford cars are always going, wherever and whenever you see them, through sand and mud, through slush, snow and water, up hills, across fields and roadless plains. 6. Control to hold its speed always in hand, calmly and safely meeting every emergency and contingency, either in the crowded streets of the city 
or on dangerous roads. The planetary transmission of the Ford gave this control, and anybody could work it. That is the why of the saying, anybody can drive a Ford. It can turn around almost anywhere. 7. The more a motor car weighs, naturally the more fuel and lubricants are used in the driving. The lighter the weight, the lighter the expense of operation. The light weight of the Ford car, in its early years, was used as an argument against it. Now that is all changed. The design which I settled upon was called Model T. The important feature of the new model, which, if it were accepted, as I thought it would be, I intended to make the only model and then start into real production, was its simplicity. There were but four constructional units in the car, the power plant, the frame, the front axle, and the rear axle. All of these were easily accessible and they were designed so that no special skill would be required for their repair or replacement. I believe then, although I said very little about it because of the novelty of the idea, that it ought to be possible to have parts so simple and so inexpensive that the menace of expensive hand repair work would be entirely eliminated. The parts could be made so cheaply that it would be less expensive to buy new ones than to have old ones repaired. They could be carried in hardware shops just as nails or bolts are carried. I thought that it was up to me, as a designer, to make the car so completely simple that no one could fail to understand it. That works both ways and applies to everything. The less complex an article, the easier it is to make, the cheaper it may be sold, and therefore the greater number may be sold. It is not necessary to go into the technical details of the construction, but perhaps this is as good a place as any to review the various models, because Model T was the last of the models, and the policy which it brought about took this business out of the ordinary line of business. Application of the same idea would take any business out of the ordinary run. I designed eight models in all before Model T. They were Model A, Model B, Model C, Model F, Model N, Model R, Model S, and Model K. Of these, Models A, C, and F had two-cylinder opposed horizontal motors. In Model A, the motor was at the rear of the driver's seat. In all of the other models, it was in a hood in front. Models B, N, R, and S had motors of the four-cylinder vertical type. Model K had six cylinders. Model A developed eight horsepower, Model B developed 24 horsepower with a 4.5 inch cylinder and a 5 inch stroke. The highest horsepower was in Model K, the six cylinder car, which developed 40 horsepower. The largest cylinders were those of Model B. The smallest were in models N, R, and S, which were 3 and 3 quarter inches in diameter with a three and three-eighths inch stroke. Model T has a three and three-fourths inch cylinder with a four inch stroke. The ignition was by dry batteries in all, excepting Model B, which had storage batteries, and in Model K, which had both battery and magneto. In the present model, the magneto is a part of the power plant and is built in. The clutch of the first four models was of the cone type, in the last four, and in the present model, of the multiple disc type. The transmission in all of the cars has been planetary. Model A had a chain drive. Model B had a shaft drive. The next two models had chain drives. Since then, all of the cars have had shaft drives. Model A had a 72-inch wheelbase. Model B 
which was an extremely good car, had 92 inches. Model K had 120 inches. Model C had 78 inches. The others had 84 inches, and the present car has 100 inches. In the first five models, all of the equipment was extra. The next three were sold with a partial equipment. The present car is sold with full equipment. Model A weighed 1,250 pounds. The lightest cars were models N and R. They weighed 1,050 pounds, but they were both runabouts. The heaviest car was the six-cylinder, which weighed 2,000 pounds. The present car weighs 1,200 pounds. The Model T had practically no features which were not contained in some one or other of the previous models. Every detail had been fully tested in practice. There was no guessing as to whether or not it would be a successful model. It had to be. There was no way it could escape being so, for it had not been made in a day. It contained all that I was then able to put into a motor car plus the material for which the first time I was able to obtain. We put out Model T for the season 1908 to 1909. The company was then five years old. The original factory space had been 0.28 acres. We had employed an average of 311 people in the first year, built 1,708 cars, and had one branch house. In 1908, the factory space had increased to 2.65 acres, and we owned the building. The average number of employees had increased to 1,908. We built 6,181 cars and had 14 branch houses. It was a prosperous business. During the season 1908 to 1909, we continued to make models R and S, four-cylinder runabouts and roadsters, the models that had previously been so successful, and which sold at $700 and $750. But Model T swept them right out. We sold 10,607 cars, a larger number than any manufacturer had ever sold. The price for the touring car was $850. On the same chassis, we mounted a town car at $1,000, a roadster at $825, a coupe at $950, and a landaulet at $950. This season demonstrated conclusively to me that it was time to put the new policy in force. The salesmen, before I had announced the policy, were spurred by the great sales to think that even greater sales might be had if only we had more models. It is strange how, just as soon as an article becomes successful, somebody starts to think that it would be more successful, if only it were different. There is a tendency to keep monkeying with styles and to spoil a good thing by changing it. The salesmen were insistent on increasing the line. They listened to the 5%, the special customers, who could say what they wanted, and forgot all about the 95%, who just bought without making any fuss. No business can improve unless it pays the closest possible attention to complaints and suggestions. If there is any defect in service, then that must be instantly and rigorously investigated. But when the suggestion is only as to style, one has to make sure whether it is not merely a personal whim that is being voiced. Salesmen always want to cater to whims instead of acquiring sufficient knowledge of their product to be able to explain to the customer with the whim that what they have will satisfy his every requirement. That is, of course, provided what they have does satisfy these requirements. 
Therefore, in 1909, I announced one morning, without any previous warning, that in the future we were going to build only one model, that the model was going to be Model T, and that the chassis would be exactly the same for all cars. And I remarked, any customer can have a car painted any color that he wants, so long as it is black. I cannot say that anyone agreed with me. The selling people could not, of course, see the advantages that a single model would bring about in production. More than that, they did not particularly care. They thought that our production was good enough as it was, and there was a very decided opinion that lowering the sales price would hurt sales, that the people who wanted quality would be driven away, and that there would be none to replace them. There was very little conception of the motor industry. A motor car was still regarded as something in the way of a luxury. The manufacturers did a good deal to spread this idea. Some clever persons invented the name pleasure car, and the advertising emphasized the pleasure features. The salespeople had ground for their objections, and particularly when I made the following announcement. I will build a motor car for the great multitude. It will be large enough for the family, but small enough for the individual to run and care for. It will be constructed of the best materials, by the best men to be hired, after the simplest designs that modern engineering can devise. But it will be so low in price that no man making a good salary will be unable to own one and enjoy with his family the blessing of hours of pleasure in God's great open spaces. This announcement was received not without pleasure. The general comment was, if Ford does that, he will be out of business in six months. The impression was that a good car could not be built at a low price, and that, anyhow, there was no use in building a low-priced car because only wealthy people were in the market for cars. The 1908 to 1909 sales of more than 10,000 cars had convinced me that we needed a new factory. We already had a big modern factory, the Piquette Street plant. It was as good as, perhaps a little better than, any automobile factory in the country. But I did not see how it was going to care for the sales and production that were inevitable. So I bought 60 acres at Highland Park, which was then considered a way out in the country from Detroit. The amount of ground bought and the plans for a bigger factory than the world has ever seen were opposed. The question was already being asked, how soon will Ford blow up? Nobody knows how many thousand times it has been asked since. It is asked only because of the failure to grasp that a principle rather than an individual is at work, and the principle is so simple that it seems mysterious. For 1909 to 1910, in order to pay for the new land and buildings, I slightly raised the prices. This is perfectly justifiable and results in a benefit, not an injury, to the purchaser. I did exactly the same thing a few years ago, or rather, in that case, I did not lower the price as is my annual custom in order to build the River Rouge plant. The extra money might in each case have been had by borrowing, but then we should have had a continuing charge upon the business, and all subsequent cars would have had to bear this charge. The price of all the models was increased $100, with the exception of the Roadster, which was increased only $75, and of the Land Olay and Town Car, which were increased $150 and $200 respectively. We sold 18,664 cars, 
and then for 1910 to 1911, with new facilities, I cut the touring car from 950 to 780, and we sold 34,528 cars. That is the beginning of the steady reduction in the price of the cars in the face of ever-increasing cost of materials and ever-higher wages. Contrast the year 1908 with the year 1911. The factory space increased from 2.65 to 32 acres. The average number of employees from 1,908 to 4,110, and the cars built from a little over 6,000 to nearly 35,000. You will note that men were not employed in proportion to the output. We were, almost overnight as it seems, in great production. How did all this come about? Simply through the application of an inevitable principle. By the application of intelligently directed power and machinery. In a little dark shop on a side street an old man had labored for years making axe handles. Out of seasoned hickory he fashioned them with the help of a draw shave, a chisel, and a supply of sandpaper. Carefully was each handle weighed and balanced. No two of them were alike. The curve must exactly fit the hand and must conform to the grain of the wood. From dawn until dark, the old man labored. His average product was eight handles a week, for which he received a dollar and a half each, and often some of these were unsaleable because the balance was not true. Today, you can buy a better axe handle made by machinery for a few cents, and you need not worry about the balance. They are all alike, and every one is perfect. Modern methods, applied in a big way, have not only brought the cost of the axe handles down to a fraction of their former cost, but they have immensely improved the product. It was the application of these same methods to the making of the Ford car that at the very start lowered the price and heightened the quality. We just developed an idea. The nucleus of a business may be an idea. That is, an inventor or a thoughtful workman works out a new and better way to serve some established human need. The idea commends itself, and people want to avail themselves of it. In this way, a single individual may prove, through his idea or discovery, the nucleus of a business but the creation of the body and bulk of that business is shared by everyone who has anything to do with it. No manufacturer can say, I built this business, if he has required the help of thousands of men in building it. It is a joint production. Everyone employed in it has contributed something to it. By working and producing, they make it possible for the purchasing world to keep coming to that business for the type of service it provides, and thus they help establish a custom, a trade, a habit which supplies them with a livelihood. That is the way our company grew, and just how I shall start explaining in the next chapter. In the meantime, the company had become worldwide. We had branches in London and in Australia. We were shipping to every part of the world, and in England particularly, we were beginning to be as well known as in America. The introduction of the car in England was somewhat difficult on account of the failure of the American bicycle, because the American bicycle had not been suited to English uses, it was taken for granted, and made a point of by the distributors that no American vehicle could appeal to the British market. Two Model A's found their way to England in 1903. The newspapers refused to notice them. The automobile agents refused to take the slightest interest. It was rumored 
that the principal components of its manufacture were string and hoop wire, and that a buyer would be lucky if it held together for a fortnight. In the first year, about a dozen cars in all were used. The second was only a little better. And I may say as to the reliability of that Model A, that most of them after nearly 20 years are still in some kind of service in England. In 1905, our agent entered a Model C in the Scottish reliability trials. In those days, reliability runs were more popular in England than motor races. Perhaps there was no inkling that, after all, an automobile was not merely a toy. The Scottish trials was over 800 miles of hilly, heavy roads. The Ford came through with only one involuntary stop against it. That started the Ford sales in England. In that same year, Ford taxicabs were placed in London for the first time. In the next several years, the sales began to pick up. The cars went into every endurance and reliability test and won every one of them. The Brighton dealer had ten Fords driven over the South Downs for two days in a kind of steeplechase, and every one of them came through. As a result, 600 cars were sold that year. In 1911, Henry Alexander drove a Model T to the top of Ben Nevis, 4,600 feet. That year, 14,060 cars were sold in England, and it has never since been necessary to stage any kind of a stunt. We eventually opened our own factory at Manchester. At first it was purely an assembling plant, but as the years have gone by, we have progressively made more and more of the car. End of chapter 4「Five of My Life and Work. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Marcetich, Alexandria, Virginia, June 2010. My Life and Work by Henry Ford, in collaboration with Samuel Crowther. Chapter 5. Getting into Production If a device would save in time just 10%, or increase results 10%, then its absence is always a 10% tax. If the time of a person is worth 50 cents an hour, a 10% saving is worth 5 cents an hour. If the owner of a skyscraper could increase his income 10%, he would willingly pay half the increase just to know how. The reason why he owns a skyscraper is that science has proved that certain materials used in a given way can save space and increase rental incomes. A building 30 stories high needs no more ground space than one 5 stories high. Getting along with the old style architecture costs the five-story man the income of twenty-five floors. Save ten steps a day for each of twelve thousand employees, and you will have saved fifty miles of wasted motion and misspent energy. Those are the principles on which the production of my plant was built up. They all come practically as of course. In the beginning, we tried to get machinists. As the necessity for production increased, it became apparent not only that enough machinists were not to be had, but also that skilled men were not necessary in production, and out of this grew a principle that I later want to present in full. It is self-evident that a majority of the people in the world are not mentally, even if they are physically, capable of making a good living. That is, they are not capable of furnishing with their own hands a sufficient quantity of the goods which this world needs to be able to exchange their unaided product for the goods which they need. 
I have heard it said, in fact, I believe it is quite a current thought, that we have taken skill out of work. We have not. We have put in skill. We have put a higher skill into planning, management, and tool building. And the results of that skill are enjoyed by the man who is not skilled. This I shall later enlarge on. We have to recognize the unevenness in human mental equipments. If every job in our place required skill, the place would never have existed. Sufficiently skilled men to the number needed could not have been trained in a hundred years. A million men working by hand could not even approximate our present daily output. No one could manage a million men, but more important than that, the product of the unaided hands of those million men could not be sold at a price in consonance with buying power. And even if it were possible to imagine such an aggregation and imagine its management and correlation, just think of the area that it would have to occupy. How many of the men would be engaged, not in producing, but in merely carrying from place to place what the other men had produced? I cannot see how, under such conditions, the men could possibly be paid more than ten or twenty cents a day. For, of course, it is not the employer who pays wages. He only handles the money. It is the product that pays the wages and is the management that arranges the production so that the product may pay the wages. The more economical methods of production did not begin all at once. They began gradually, just as we began gradually to make our own parts. Model T was the first motor that we made ourselves. The great economies began in assembling and then extended to other sections so that, while today we have skilled mechanics in plenty, they do not produce automobiles. They make it easy for others to produce them. Our skilled men are the tool makers, the experimental workmen, the machinists, and the pattern makers. They are as good as any men in the world. So good, indeed, that they should not be wasted in doing that which the machines they contrive can do better. The rank and file of men come to us unskilled. They learn their jobs within a few hours or a few days. If they do not learn within that time, they will never be of any use to us. These men are, many of them, foreigners, and all that is required before they are taken on is that they should be potentially able to do enough work to pay the overhead charges on the floor space they occupy. They do not have to be able-bodied men. We have jobs that require great physical strength, although they are rapidly lessening. We have other jobs that require no strength whatever, jobs which, as far as strength is concerned, might be attended to by a child of three. It is not possible, without going deeply into technical processes, to present the whole development of manufacturing, step by step, in the order in which each thing came about. I do not know that this could be done, because something has been happening nearly every day, and nobody can keep track. Take at random a number of the changes. From them, it is possible not only to gain some idea of what will happen when this world is put on a production basis, but also to see how much more we pay for things than we ought to, and how much lower wages are than they ought to be, and what a vast field remains to be explored. The Ford Company is only a little way along on the journey. A Ford car contains about 5,000 parts that is, counting screws, nuts, and all. Some of the other parts are fairly bulky, and others are almost the size of watch parts. In our first assembling, we simply started to put a car together at a spot on the floor, and workmen brought to it the parts as they were needed in exactly the same way that one builds a house. When we started to make parts, it was natural to create a single department of the factory to make that part, 
but usually one workman performed all of the operations necessary on a small part. The rapid press of production made it necessary to devise plans of production that would avoid having the workers falling over one another. The undirected worker spends more of his time walking about for materials and tools than he does in working. He gets small pay because pedestrianism is not a highly paid line. The first step forward in assembly came when we began taking the work to the men instead of the men to the work. We now have two general principles in all operations, that a man shall never have to take more than one step, if possibly it can be avoided, and that no man need ever stoop over. The principles of assembly are these. 1. Place the tools and the men in the sequence of the operation so that each component part shall travel the least possible distance while in the process of finishing. 2. Use work slides or some other form of carrier so that when a workman completes his operation, he drops the part always in the same place, which place must always be the most convenient place to his hand, and if possible, have gravity carry the part to the next workman for his operation. 3. Use sliding assembly lines by which the parts to be assembled are delivered at convenient distances. The net result of the application of these principles is the reduction of the necessity for thought on the part of the worker and the reduction of his movements to a minimum. He does, as nearly as possible, only one thing, with only one movement. The assembling of the chassis is, from the point of view of the non-mechanical mind, our most interesting and perhaps best known operation, and at one time it was an exceedingly important operation. We now ship out the parts for assembly at the point of distribution. Along about April 1st, 1913, we first tried the experiment of an assembly line, we tried it on assembling the flywheel magneto. We try everything in a little way first. We will rip out anything once we discover a better way, but we have to know absolutely that the new way is going to be better than the old before we do anything drastic. I believe that this was the first moving line ever installed. The idea came in a general way from the overhead trolley that the Chicago Packers use in dressing beef. We had previously assembled the flywheel magneto in the usual method. With one workman doing a complete job, he could turn out from 35 to 40 pieces in a nine-hour day, or about 20 minutes to an assembly. What he did alone was then spread into 29 operations. That cut down the assembly time to 13 minutes, 10 seconds. Then, we raised the height of the line 8 inches, this was in 1914, and cut the time to 7 minutes. Further experimenting with the speed that the work should move at, cut the time down to 5 minutes. In short, the result is this. By the aid of scientific study, one man is now able to do somewhat more than four did only a comparatively few years ago. That line established the efficiency of the method, and we now use it everywhere. The assembling of the motor, formerly done by one man, is now divided into 84 operations. Those men do the work that three times their number formerly did. In a short time, we tried out the plan on the chassis. About the best we had done in stationary chassis assembling was an average of 12 hours and 28 minutes per chassis. We tried the experiment of drawing the chassis with a rope and windlass down a line 250 feet long. Six assemblers traveled with the chassis and picked up the parts from piles placed along the line. This rough experiment reduced the time to 5 hours 50 minutes per chassis. In the early part of 1914, we elevated the assembly line. We had adopted the policy of man-high work. 
we had one line twenty six and three quarter inches and another twenty four and one half inches from the floor to suit squads of different heights the waist high arrangement and a further subdivision of work so that each man had fewer movements cut down the labor time per chassis to one hour thirty three minutes only the chassis was then assembled in the line the body was placed on in john r street the famous street that runs through our highland park factories now the line assembles the whole car it must not be imagined however that all this worked out as quickly as it sounds the speed of the moving work had to be carefully tried out in the flywheel magneto we first had a speed of sixty inches per minute that was too fast then we tried eighteen inches per minute that was too slow finally we settled on forty four inches per minute the idea is that a man must not be hurried in his work he must have every second necessary but not a single unnecessary second we have worked out speeds for each assembly for the success of the chassis assembly caused us gradually to overhaul our entire method of manufacturing and to put all assembling in mechanically driven lines the chassis assembling line for instance goes at a pace of six feet per minute. The front axle assembly line goes at 189 inches per minute. In the chassis assembling are 45 separate operations or stations. The first men fasten four mud guard brackets to the chassis frame. The motor arrives on the tenth operation, and so on in detail. Some men do only one or two small operations, others do more. The man who places a part does not fasten it. The part may not be fully in place until several operations later. The man who puts in a bolt does not put on the bolt. The man who puts on the nut does not tighten it. On operation number 34, the budding motor gets its gasoline. It has previously received lubrication. On operation number 44, the radiator is filled with water, and on operation number 45, the car drives out onto John R. Street. Essentially, the same ideas have been applied to the assembling of the motor. In October 1913, it required nine hours and 54 minutes of labor time to assemble one motor. Six months later, by the moving assembly method, this time had been reduced to five hours and fifty-six minutes. Every piece of work in the shops moves. It may move on hooks on overhead chains going to assembly in the exact order in which the parts are required. It may travel on a moving platform, or it may go by gravity. But the point is that there is no lifting or trucking of anything other than materials. Materials are brought in on small trucks or trailers operated by cut-down Ford chassis, which are sufficiently mobile and quick to get in and out of any aisle where they may be required to go. No workman has anything to do with moving or lifting anything. That is all in a separate department the Department of Transportation. We started assembling a motor car in a single factory. Then, as we began to make parts, we began to departmentalize so that each department would do only one thing. As the factory is now organized, each department makes only a single part or assembles a part. A department is a little factory in itself. The part comes into it as raw material or as a casting, goes through the sequence of machines and heat treatments, or whatever may be required, and leaves that department finished. It was only because of transport ease that the departments were grouped together when we started to manufacture. I did not know that such minute divisions would be possible, but as our production grew and departments multiplied, 
we actually changed from making automobiles to making parts. Then we found that we had made another new discovery, which was that by no means all of the parts had to be made in one factory. It was not really a discovery. It was something in the nature of going around in a circle to my first manufacturing when I bought the motors and probably 90% of the parts. When we began to make our own parts, we practically took for granted that they all had to be made in the one factory, that there was some special virtue in having a single roof over the manufacture of the entire car. We have now developed away from this. If we build any more large factories, it will be only because the making of a single part must be in such tremendous volume as to require a large unit. I hope that in the course of time, the big Highland Park plant will be doing only one or two things. The casting has already been taken away from it and has gone to the River Rouge plant. So now we are on our way back to where we started from, excepting that instead of buying our parts on the outside, we are beginning to make them in our own factories on the outside. This is a development which holds exceptional consequences, for it means, as I shall enlarge in a later chapter, that highly standardized, highly subdivided industry needs no longer become concentrated in large plants, with all the inconveniences of transportation and housing that hamper large plants. A thousand or five hundred men ought to be enough in a single factory. Then there would be no problem of transporting them to work or away from work, and there would be no slums or any of the other unnatural ways of living incident to the overcrowding that must take place if the workmen are to live within reasonable distances of a very large plant. Highland Park now has 500 departments. Down at our Piquette plant, we had only 18 departments, and formerly at Highland Park, we had only 150 departments. This illustrates how far we are going in the manufacture of parts. Hardly a week passes without some improvement being made somewhere in machine or process, and sometimes this is made in defiance of what is called the best shop practice. I recall that a machine manufacturer was once called into conference on the building of a special machine. The specifications called for an output of 200 per hour. This is a mistake, said the manufacturer. You mean 200 a day. No machine can be forced to 200 an hour. The company officer sent for the man who had designed the machine, and they called his attention to the specification. He said, Yes, what about it? It can't be done, said the manufacturer positively. No machine built will do that. It is out of the question. Out of the question, exclaimed the engineer. If you will come down to the main floor, you will see one doing it. We built one to see if it could be done, and now we want more like it. The factory keeps no record of experiments. The foremen and superintendents remember what has been done. If a certain method has formerly been tried and failed, somebody will remember it. But I am not particularly anxious for the men to remember what someone else has tried to do in the past, for then we might quickly accumulate far too many things that could not be done. That is one of the troubles with extensive records. If you keep on recording all of your failures, you will shortly have a list showing that there is nothing left for you to try, whereas it by no means follows, because one man has failed in a certain method, that another man will not succeed. They told us we could not cast gray iron by our endless chain method, and I believe there is a record of failures, but we are doing it. The man who carried through our work either did not know or paid no attention to the previous figures. Likewise, we were told that it was out of the question 
to pour the hot iron directly from the blast furnace into mold. The usual method is to run the iron into pigs, let them season for a time, and then remelt them for casting. But at the River Rouge plant, we are casting directly from cupolas that are filled from the blast furnaces. Then, too, a record of failures, particularly if it is a dignified and a well-authenticated record, deters a young man from trying. We get some of our best results from letting fools rush in where angels fear to tread. None of our men are experts. We have most unfortunately found it necessary to get rid of a man as soon as he thinks himself an expert, because no one ever considers himself an expert if he really knows his job. A man who knows a job sees so much more to be done than he has done, that he is always pressing forward and never gives up an instant of thought to how good and how efficient he is. Thinking always ahead, thinking always of trying to do more, brings a state of mind in which nothing is impossible. The moment one gets into the expert state of mind, a great number of things become impossible. I refuse to recognize that there are impossibilities. I cannot discover that anyone knows enough about anything on this earth definitely to say what is and what is not possible. The right kind of experience, the right kind of technical training, ought to enlarge the mind and reduce the number of impossibilities. It unfortunately does nothing of the kind. Most technical training, and the average of that which we call experience, provide a record of previous failures, and, instead of these failures being taken for what they are worth, they are taken as absolute bars to progress. If some man, calling himself an authority, says that this or that cannot be done, then a horde of unthinking followers start the chorus. It can't be done. Take castings. Castings has always been a wasteful process, and is so old that it has accumulated many traditions, which make improvements extraordinarily difficult to bring about. I believe one authority on molding declared, before we started our experiments, that any man who said he could reduce costs within half a year wrote himself down as a fraud. Our foundry used to be much like other foundries. When we cast the first Model T cylinders in 1910, everything in the place was done by hand. Shovels and wheelbarrows abounded. The work was then either skilled or unskilled. We had molders and we had laborers. Now we have about 5% of thoroughly skilled molders and coarse setters, but the remaining 95% are unskilled, or to put it more accurately, must be skilled in exactly one operation which the most stupid man can learn within two days. The molding is all done by machinery. Each part which we have to cast has a unit or units of its own, according to the number required in the plan of production. The machinery of the unit is adapted to the single casting. Thus the men in the unit each perform a single operation that is always the same. The unit consists of an overhead railway to which at intervals are hung little platforms for the molds. Without going into technical details, let me say the making of the molds and the cores, and the packing of the cores, are done with the work in motion on the platforms. The metal is poured at another point as the work moves, and by the time the mold in which the metal has been poured reaches the terminal, it is cool enough to start on its automatic way to cleaning, machining, and assembling and the platform is moving around for a new load. Take the development of the piston rod assembly. Even under the old plan, this operation took only three minutes and did not seem to be one to bother about. There were two benches and 28 men in all. They assembled 175 pistons and rods in a nine-hour day. 
which means just five seconds over three minutes each. There was no inspection, and many of the piston and rod assemblies came back from the motor assembling line as defective. It is a very simple operation. The workman pushed the pin out of the piston, oiled the pin, slipped the rod in place, put the pin through the rod and piston, tightened one screw, and opened another screw. That was the whole operation. The foreman, examining the operation, could not discover why it should take as much as three minutes. He analyzed the motions with a stopwatch. He found that four hours out of a nine-hour day were spent in walking. The assembler did not go off anywhere, but he had to shift his feet to gather in his materials and to push away the finished piece. In the whole task, each man performed six operations. The foreman devised a new plan. He split the operation into three divisions, put a slide on the bench and three men on each side of it, and an inspector at the end. Instead of one man performing the whole operation, one man then performed only one-third of the operation. He performed only as much as he could do without shifting his feet. They cut down the squad from 28 to 14 men. The former record for 28 men was 175 assemblies a day. Now seven men turn out 2,600 assemblies in eight hours. It is not necessary to calculate the savings there. Painting the rear axle assembly once gave some trouble. It used to be dipped by hand into a tank of enamel. This required several handlings and the services of two men. Now one man takes care of it all on a special machine designed and built in the factory. The man now merely hangs the assembly on a moving chain which carries it up over the enamel tank. Two levers then thrust thimbles over the ends of the ladle shaft. The paint tank rises six feet, immerses the axle, returns to position, and the axle goes on to the drying oven. The whole cycle of operations now takes just 13 seconds. The radiator is a complex affair, and soldering it used to be a matter of skill. There are 95 tubes in a radiator. Fitting and soldering these tubes in place is by hand a long operation requiring both skill and patience. Now, it is all done by a machine, which will make 1,200 radiator cores in eight hours. Then they are soldered in place by being carried through a furnace by a conveyor. No tinsmith work and no skill are required. We used to rivet the crankcase arms to the crankcase using pneumatic hammers, which were supposed to be the latest development. It took six men to hold the hammers and six men to hold the casings, and the din was terrific. Now an automatic press operated by one man, who does nothing else, gets through five times as much work in a day as those twelve men did. In the piquette plant, the cylinder casting traveled four thousand feet in the course of finishing. Now it travels only slightly over three hundred feet. There is no manual handling of material. There is not a single hand operation. If a machine can be made automatic, it is made automatic. Not a single operation is ever considered as being done in the best or cheapest way. At that, only about 10% of our tools are special. The others are regular machines adjusted to the particular job, and they are placed almost side by side. We put more machinery per square foot of floor space than any other factory in the world. Every foot of space, not used, carries an overhead expense. We want none of that waste. Yet there is all the room needed. No man has too much room and no man has too little room. Dividing and subdividing operations, keeping the work in motion, those are the keynotes of production. But also, it is to be remembered 
that all the parts are designed so that they can be most easily made. And the saving? Although the comparison is not quite fair, it is startling. If at our present rate of production we employ the same number of men per car that we did when we began in 1903, and those men were only for assembly, we should today require a force of more than 200,000. We have less than 50,000 men on automobile production at our highest point of around 4,000 cars a day. End of chapter 5